Professor Sudhakaran, Professor and former HOD, Department of Biochemistry, and Emeritus Scientist, Department of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics, to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. So welcome back to the session. We'll have the first uh, uh, technical lecture, the keynote lecture, to be delivered by a very distinguished uh, scientist, uh, Sir Tom Blunder. We are extremely fortunate uh, to have uh, uh, Sir Tom Blundell with us to deliver the keynote lecture. A person with a, a distinguished career uh, spanning over uh, nearly six decades. Uh, starting his uh, research uh, career under uh, the academic advisor Nobel laureate uh, Dorothy Hodgins, where he worked out the uh, three-dimensional structure of uh, insulin. And that was the time when perhaps uh, for the first time he got associated with an Indian scientist, Professor Vijayan, who has been a wonderful molecular biophysicist, who has been associated with us for, on several occasions. Professor Vijayan has been so kind enough to provide us uh, both academic and other support to build up this uh, center. And uh, Sir Tom Lender has been working under Dorothy Hodkins along with uh, uh, Dr. Vijayan in 60s. Dorothy Hodkins, as all of you know, is uh, the recipient of the Nobel Prize for the elucidation of the structure of vitamin uh, B12. Uh, uh, Sir Tom Blender was a distinguished academic. He taught in uh, University of Oxford, in uh, uh, University of Sussex, uh, Birkbeck College and University of London, before joining uh, the Cambridge University as the Sir William Dunn Professor and Head of the Department of uh, Biochemistry in 1996. He continued there as uh, Head of the Department of Biochemistry as well as the uh, Chairman of the School of Biological Sciences till 2009. Since then, he is continuing now he is continuing as uh, director of research and professor emeritus in the Department of Biochemistry, University of Cam Cambridge. He has been a, a wonderful scientist. Uh, the other day he was referring to uh, postdocs from different countries working in his lab for the past uh, 35, 40 years, people from different countries, but to all of them, he has been speaking in English. His major areas of research include molecular, structural, and computational biology of growth factors, <coughs> receptor activation, cell signaling, DNA repair and mechanisms, particularly with respect to cancer, infectious diseases, particularly uh, tuberculosis, and also of late in familial diseases. He has published over 560 publications of which more than 30 papers are in nature. During the last six months, he was told, he has published 16 papers, of which two papers are in nature. So, science. so sorry, in the science. And uh, not only in experimental science, he has uh, published many widely used software packages for protein modeling and design, including Modeller, which most of you must be familiar, and FUGU, as well as computer programs to predict 
the effect of mutations on protein stability and interaction. Recently, his group has produced computer program and databases to predict the effects of mutations on small molecule binding, which is particularly relevant to uh, antibiotic resistance, for example, uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis resistance. He has been quite successful in employing some of these recent uh, uh, approaches to structure-guided and uh, fragment-based drug discovery. So more than a scientist, more than an academic, he has been a brilliant entrepreneur also. He, f along with uh, two other academics and uh, two non-academics, five people, started a company in 1999 called Aztecs Therapeutics, essentially an oncology company, which I am not telling about the investment, in the original investment. Only thing is that in 2013, this company was sold for one, nearly $1 billion. So you can imagine uh, the success. Remember, this is started in a scientific park in as part of the Cambridge University. We also have a technology techno park near our university. This was started as a company in Cambridge University in its uh, science park, and that has been quite successful. And now he has at least uh, uh, 10 mycobacterium tubercular protein related uh, drug targets, which is supported by Bill Gates Foundation. He has been not only academic, a scientist and entrepreneur, he has also been a uh, science manager and uh, has uh, significantly influenced uh, uh, scientific policy of uh, England. Uh, Sir Tom was a member of uh, uh, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's Advisory Council on Science and Technology. He was the founding CEO of the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council. Uh, he has been a member of the Royal Commission on Environment is the deputy chair of the Institute of Cancer Research and president of the UK Science Council since 2011. He's a fellow of the uh, Royal Society uh, and uh, has uh, earned his degree and has uh, 15 honorary doctorates from uh, several other universities. And extensively traveled, extensively uh, interactive scientist who has uh, visited India quite often, quite a number of friends all over the laboratories uh, in India. Uh, this afternoon, uh, Sir Tom Lundell is going to speak on multi-protein assemblies in space and time, its implications for cell signaling and uh, drug discovery. We are extremely happy that uh, so Tom has agreed to, was in response to our invitation, has kindly agreed to come over here and participate in this uh, symposium and deliver the keynote address. Once again, I, on behalf of the Department of Computational Biology and Bioinformatics and on behalf of the organizers of this uh, uh, symposium, uh, welcome you. So, to this session. Well, uh, colleagues, uh, Professor Nair, uh, many other uh, very hardworking people in this department, thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation to come uh, to Kerala, uh, a, a place uh, where I really do enjoy coming. Uh, I, I have to admit that the first time I came to Kerala, I came with friends who were musicians uh, um, uh, involved in politics and I came. I brought them here because I knew no one in Kerala and I thought I wouldn't be disturbed uh, by visiting universities. I'm afraid that I cannot do that now. I know many people here and it's been a real pleasure uh, to make your acquaintance. 
So what I'm going to do today is to talk about, I'll change the title slightly, molecular complexity. And I'm going to argue that uh, complexity um, over space and time is critical for getting high signal to noise in biological systems. In other words, uh, you will not get selectivity um, if you depend entirely on simple binary interactions. That is my thesis. Most of my talk will be about complexity, but of course when we're trying to fight complexity, we have to reduce it. And so you'll see that my uh, discussion on founding companies is really focusing on ways of decreasing the complexity in order to simplify the screening process. So it's about the importance of complexity in life, but also the importance of reducing that complexity to, to understand and to influence it. So what I do, of course, is to say, uh, can I have this light off, do you think? Uh, so Because my slide is not quite as bright as it should be. So I'm going to begin by talking about the, the uh, major t technical change that really um, changed the, uh, all of our lives as scientists, and that is uh, over the past uh, few years, uh, the second generation sequencing, which has made available all kinds of knowledge and a foundation for further research, as well, of course, as uh, providing the basis for personal medicine that we've already heard about today. I'll briefly talk about human genome. I'll focus on one uh, pathogen. Uh, in fact, uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, um, the genome center in uh, Hinkston near Cambridge, recently gave me 3,000 sequences of strain variation. And I'll tell you how we're setting up a program in collaboration with the Chennai Institute of uh, Tuberculosis uh, to not only uh, set up the sequencing, but to analyze it. So I'll make the case that this is changing things and we have to understand it, and that's where computational biology comes in. I'll give examples of experimental uh, work outcomes about complexity. So this is a rather simplified diagram of what happens on many membrane surfaces when you have a, a ligand binding to a complex series of receptors. It's not a simple ligand hormone growth factor uh, uh, receptor interaction. And that complexity also is found in the core of the cell in the nucleus. I'll mention just very briefly something about DNA repair signaling, where this molecule, which has 4,000 amino acids in it, and we published the structure um, at low resolution about five years ago, uh, that has 12 other partners in order to carry out its role of uh, repairing DNA double-strand breaks. Now, all of these are experimental methods, and my view has always been that in my lab I do experiments and I do computation. I began to do computation in a very amateur way in the 1960s, and then I recruited a lot of really good computer scientists, so the quality of what I produced has increased. But I believe very, very strongly that one has to integrate informatics and experiment uh, for the good of both. Um, and many, many informaticians are isolated uh, from experiment, and I think this is a very poor way to develop. And what's very interesting is many informaticians are now setting up their own experiments. And I think they're about 40 years after I was telling people to do that, <laughs> but it's never too late. So that's all very exciting, uh, but the problem we have, of course, is that these experiments take many years to do. The program understanding this molecule has already taken 10 years with several postdocs. And so we have to use computational biology to develop a knowledge of the proteome. We can see the genome, 
Uh, if we want to know about the proteome, I can tell you that even in Mycobacterium tuberculosis, we only have 10% of the architectures of the gene products. We don't know the functions of all the genes, so there are many challenges, um, and we need to organize our information in databases, uh, mention that. We need to have computational methods to look at the landscapes of the surface of these molecules if we want to regulate them in some way using drugs of some sort. But again, in order to do that, we need computational modern relational databases uh, to organize the information that we have about small molecule interactions. So the emphasis is that we've gone a long way with experiment, but we can use computational work now to extend that, and I'll try to exemplify it as I go along. Now, as uh, was said in the introduction, I've always been involved in structure-guided drug discovery, even at the large molecule level with insulin in the 1960s. But I've spent a lot of time over the last 35 years really developing structure-guided methods uh, for developing candidates. And you've already heard that one of our companies um, had, uh, in fact, 10 drugs in clinical trials when we sold it for 886 million dollars. That started in my lab with two postdocs in the lab. Um, at the time, I think you were still there, Srini and, <laughs> and Saldamini. <laughs> it, it grew from that and we moved it to the science park. Of course, the challenge that we have now is that the drugs that we have, we use in combinations to avoid um, drug uh, resistance. But even that policy, especially with things like tuberculosis, becomes a huge challenge because um, the regime is difficult to follow. It takes nine months uh, of treatment, even where you haven't got resistance. And so we're getting resistance in almost every uh, um, pathogen, uh, and that's going to change the way we live, the way we do operations. Everything will change unless we can regulate and learn how to respond to it. So I'll talk a little bit about mathematical methods um, that uh, my group has been involved in recently. Uh, the early ones uh, where Srinivasan was involved uh, were really statistical methods, looking at knowledge uh, and expressing it uh, as thermodynamic terms. Uh, in the last two or three years, we've been mainly focusing on machine learning, and that has a very powerful uh, um, way uh, of increasing our knowledge. So that's the story I'm going to tell you, and I'll try to go a little bit quicker than I have now, otherwise you won't get any cultural uh, uh, part of the evening. Um, so let me say that the reason uh, we might advance for understanding molecular complexity is, in fact, that the present-day drugs are not very selective. In my company, we've spent most of the last... Uh, what is it now, 17 years, um, developing drugs using kinases as targets. Uh, I thought they were selective when we began. Uh, the, all those years later, we know that very few of them are. Whereas kinases have 500 members in the human genome, um, they have different methods of regulation. So the complexity that comes in to get high signal to noise, that I'll argue, is, is in fact in these multi-protein complex systems. And I've been in my academic lab trying to focus on how I would modulate those systems in order to get greater selectivity. And I hope as I go on that I will not only talk about the balance of experiment and computation, but also the balance between doing things in basic research in one's own lab and translating it in software and in companies outside the lab. So uh, that's um, the, the, the background. Um, and my story, and I apologize for those of you who heard me talk before, because this is a slide I quite often show, but it's a very important slide. This is Dorothy Hodgkin, when she was about the same age, I think, as most of you came up and got certificates. Uh, uh, but that was 1932 to 34, where she moved from Oxford to Cambridge to work with J.D. Bernal, 
and was the with Bernal, the first person to realize that if you want to study the architecture of biological systems, you have to keep them in a water va vapor, at least, or a water environment. And she um, took uh, crystals of pepsin and wrote a beautiful small article in Nature in 1934 describing that breakthrough and say, soon we will know the architecture of all of uh, life's uh, large molecules. I have to say that I joined the group 30 years later and she started working on insulin in 1934 when she moved back from Cambridge to Oxford and she still hadn't solved that 30 years later. So she was right <laughs> that it was important, it was right that it was powerful, but things do take a long time and one has to keep a focus in order to um, achieve that. As I walked into the laboratory in 1964, I'd been in doing some projects before, but I walked in in 1964 to start my research, and Dorothy was on the television getting the Nobel Prize. She was in Ghana, in Africa, where her husband uh, was working. Um, he was a member of the Communist Party for many years, very, very socially aware. Dorothy had, Dorothy had a very personal view of politics, very left-wing. She was stopped going into the States, um, but, but, but always very personal. I may mention some of that as I go along. But there was an expectation that we'd solve the structure of insulin, and so this is uh, five years later, we got the structure, and uh, we had this beautiful uh, molecule, which was part of a, of a wonderful, rather complex uh, uh, structure which I, at the time, likened to Chartres Cathedral window. It's beautiful. Um, and um, it was a fantastic time. And I apologize once again for those of you who've seen this picture. Um, but this is shortly after this structure in the 70s. You can see Dorothy Hodgkin had kept uh, on that focus all of this time. Um, by the way, I, I've almost all the time worked four women scientists. <laughs> and I'm very pleased to see how many you have here. Uh, it's very important because much to contribute and much undervalued. But as I like to say when I see this picture, uh, not only you could see the time that Dorothy spent on it, but you could see how beautiful I was uh, <laughs> in those days. So that uh, was where I was, but I was a rather difficult scientist. I ran a modern jazz group and I got involved in politics, quite left-wing politics, and I ran the city of Oxford for some time, in parallel to getting nature papers down here. During that time, I was actually running the city. And if you try to go through Oxford now, it's all pedestrianized, uh, 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 and I did that. <laughs> and you have to go in through by a bus lane. It's one of the few things I've done that haven't changed. <laughs> so um, I got into a state of, of crisis how should I, should I do politics? People were saying I should really go into parliament. Should I try to be a jazz musician? Mm -hmm. Well, I wasn't really good enough on that. Uh, and I decided I had to go and think about it. And I was gonna put some slides in here, but it was getting rather long. But I left Oxford um, in 72 and traveled across Siberia, uh, reaching uh, Kavarovsk in far eastern Siberia on the train. I was stuck there in the Sino-Soviet War. I found a beautiful Japanese lady uh, and helped her get back to Japan and uh, stayed in Japan. And by the way, you, somebody, you said I spoke to all my people in, in English, but I actually used yeah. to speak to them in Japanese <laughs> and one uh, or two other languages, not very well. <laughs> and um, I, I then moved down to Taiwan uh, and then through uh, Hong Kong and ended up in India. Uh, first in Calcutta and then moving down eventually to Bangalore. And that was really because I had so many colleagues, Siv Ramasation in particular, I met in 1964. And as you mentioned, uh, Vijayan was a postdoc uh, with us um, in the group. So that was an amazing time. And I again got uh, distracted and started studying the vena uh, and learning about carnatic music. Again, I didn't do it very well, 
Uh, but what I have done is insist on many meetings in, in India where I participated that some of my friends who are now professional Carnatic musicians play at meetings like this. And I'm delighted to see you have a cultural program here uh, with some good music. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so um, that, that, that's it. And we made many connections. This is a slide that I showed last week when I was uh, giving a lecture, or earlier this week, uh, honoring uh, Vijayan, who was a president of the National Academy, his um, wife, Kalyani. There's Dorothy visiting the lab. And here's Siv Ramasation uh, and his wife, uh, Kosalia. So th they're the people who attracted me to India as well as the music. And uh, it's remained a, a very powerful influence. So I thought I'd put this slide up. And um, it's not too difficult to see that it's a multinational team that I have now. Uh, Russian, a Spanish, New Zealander, African, uh, Japanese. And here's Sonny. Sonny's in the audience, uh, from Kerala, no, not from Kerala, married into Kerala. <laughs> and, and there is Sherine, who is from Kerala, Sherine Thomas. Uh, and um, we have Aaron that I met in uh, Chennai about seven or eight years ago. And we just have an amazing group of people. Here's Nupa, who's just finishing her PhD. We always have a mixture. And one of the things I'd like to boast about is that uh, my group on one time when we had a party could actually speak 37 languages between us. I, I thought that was a fair achievement. My problem was finding an Englishman or English woman. <laughs> and uh, as you can see here, I, I'm not too successful. This man's an Englishman and this is an English lady, but they're the only two in my group at the moment. So um, that's uh, the background. So. Um, Let's get down to the hard stuff. So we had this structure in 1969, and this form here is the storage form of insulin in the pancreas. It has to last there a long time. But then it it's moved into the circulation and dissociates, and the form that binds to the uh, receptor, we uh, predicted and were correct, uh, is something like this. This little bit here moves a little bit. And so we had the idea at that time that globular molecules interacted through a preformed structure. But when I left Oxford, uh, having come back to, uh, from my uh, travels around the world, Dorothy said to me, well, Tom, she said, I think you better go somewhere else. <laughs> and I decided that would be a good idea because I'd have to give up politics and focus on science and perhaps play a little less jazz, although I did continue with some Carnatic music lessons. And what I then did is to solve the structure in my own team of glucagon. And so insulin puts down sugar levels and glucagon puts them up. They're the yin and yang of sugar level control. And this molecule works in a very different way. It has a storage form, which is an oligomer, but in solution, it's a population of conformers. It's an ensemble. And I maintain that this is one of the first examples uh, uh, that where we realize that concerted folding and binding on receptors uh, was really a critical way of, of getting selectivity. And I think uh, this is what I call my insulin glucagon model, that there are two ways of getting selectivity. One is through globular molecules, and one is through concerted folding and binding. And we found this sort of model throughout now, through um, many different systems. So I then uh, went forward thinking that life was simple. And after 15 years, not quite as long as, as uh, Dorothy had um, spent, um, I uh, solved the structure of um, nerve growth factor. I seem to be getting a little enthusiastic here. Um, let me just go back. Um, and this is nerve growth factor. And this is a dimer, you see. Uh, insulin is a monomer. And that immediately uh, made me think that all you needed to do was to take two molecules around that, and you bring them together, and you've got a signal. And that model seemed to be right, because one of the things we did later 
This is a storage form of nerve growth factor. You can see the dimer of nerve growth factor organizes the storage molecules. But you can see here, things are getting a bit more complicated. And then down here, uh, a group in Genetech got the first part of the nerve growth factor receptor, and you can see it was being organized as a dimer. And here we published on the low affinity receptor. They all seem to be dimers. But as I began to think about it, I thought, this can't be true. Because uh, what happens is you have a, a, a dimeric structure, this keeps going ahead, um, like this on the receptor. Um, you might have a dimer that pulls these two together, but many of the receptors are already dimers. And even if they were separated, there would be many collisions of these molecules which would give you noise. So it's a very noisy system. Binary interactions are going to give you a lot of noise. And then uh, many people were drawing uh, the pathways for signaling as a sort of biochemical pathway of binary interactions. I thought that can't be right. And, um, and so what I proposed uh, around uh, 20 years ago uh, was that, in fact, um, these uh, molecules must be more complicated. Binary interactions are going to occur opportunistically. Uh, you need to have a reversible system, but if you have multi-protein systems, uh, then you would have cooperativity in building them up, and you would have high signal to noise. And what we found over the last 20 years is that almost every receptor, every intracellular signaling system, everything in the nucleus, almost, uh, is uh, complicated. The exception comes when you have concerted folding and binding, but many cases, uh, um, uh, it, like in the nerve, gr the fibroblast growth factor, that was drawn as a dimer. This is not my picture. Drawn as a dimer, um, uh, this is a very important molecule. Um, but when I did experiments on it um, in, uh, in the crystal structure, and then in using nanospray mass spectrometry with Carol Robinson's team, I found it wasn't a two to two to two, it was a two to two to one, and I got four to four to one, and it was much more complicated. So this paper has about a thousand uh, 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 citations. I have to say a large number of them were objecting strongly to the fact that I was saying it was more complicated, but they were maintaining they had a two to two to two structure. There is no sign of that in solution, no evidence for it. It's much more complicated uh, than that. So that's where we um, uh, got to on that, and that's really been the story. So I have a view that achieving specificity uh, can be uh, achieved by increasing complexity. So you have a clustering, and that clustering has to be reversible. Uh, but if it's cooperative, um, then you can get selectivity, which is much more difficult to get uh, with a binary system. So this was my model. Um, you have maybe a, a weak binary interaction, and then you have a cooperative formation of a larger structure. Now there's one very important uh, uh, example or set of examples which are not in accordance with that and that's the glucagon model and you find right through the cell now that there are regions which are within quite often intrinsically disordered regions but they are foldable themselves and these bind almost always with a cooperative type of binding so you can imagine you have a flexible peptide like the glucagon and a globular structure. And then the first thing that happens is you have an anchor that binds in a pocket here. And then that further interaction uh, is achieved by another interaction here. So in these cases, the concerted folding and binding gives you selectivity through cooperativity again. But you can do it binary-wise. So if you have to have a binary interaction, nature normally uses this kind of model. And why is that important to my story? It is, if you want to have concerted folding and binding, you've got to have these pockets, these anchor sites, and you can see if, if you were going to make a drug to interfere with this, this looks much more druggable than the other ones did. 
And, and this, I realized uh, 20 years after we proposed this model, uh, that it was likely to be a key to drug discovery in protein-protein interactions. And I, I'll show you some evidence for that uh, later on. Um, so um, uh, this is an example here, by the way, that we published in Nature in 2002 uh, of a, a nuclear system uh, with the uh, molecule BRCA2, the breast cancer-related gene product that obeys these rules. Okay. So they're the druggable sites, and um, here's a, a little movie of what that looks like. And you can see the BRCA2, this is a peptide within an intrinsically disordered region that folds on to RAD51. And you can see the two little pockets here um, that give you selectivity, and they're absolutely conserved in evolution. I, I won't go into the other part of this. Uh, it's getting a bit complicated. So uh, I argue that we have complexity. It's important for selectivity. If you don't have complexity in the simple sense, you have it through concerted folding and binding and a cooperative set of interactions. Now, the next question is then, how do we define all these interactions? And um, this I will go through very quickly, but it's experimental. Even if I take DNA double strand break repair, and I in a part of the cell cycle where I don't have a homologous uh, 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 chromatid, uh, then you need a large number of molecules to interact with the DNA double strand break ends and to repair them. This is a figure that we put, uh, I think, about 10 years ago. There's now, as I said, 10 or 12 uh, uh, molecules involved in this. But I started with a reductionist approach by defining all of the components or just binary interactions uh, individually. But if I want to define the whole thing, uh, then I have to start using small angle X-ray scattering, EM. EM has completely transformed everything that we're doing in structural biology over two years. India's got to move in, get yourself a central EM, cryo EM, direct uh, electron detector as soon as possible, otherwise you'll be left out of it. So th this is uh, 10 years' work, and this is 10 days' work using EM uh, uh, on, on the same molecule. It's really devastating. And, and then, uh, well, we're still doing x-rays, so that was a nature paper of some time ago. We have a new structure now, and, and we also do a lot of nanospray mass spectrometry. We have very complicated systems, uh, I like to explain this as two of these molecules interact together as if they're dancing in a pair, but as more people arrive, they form a line dance, which is a little bit helical, and then if too many arrive, they pile up on the dance floor, no dancing anymore, but in this case, you've got incredible selectivity, um, and it, it forms a tube, and inside this tube, all of the components of the DNA repair are organized. Um, so let me just um, show. So even the DNA PK ends up being organized within the system. So part of the uh, importance of these multi-component systems is facilitating uh, the co-localization over space and time. And um, uh, so I see this system as having a stage. So this is DNA PK. Just this little bit on the top is the kinase. This is a stage on which the actors uh, uh, organize themselves to carry out the DNA repair, including the DNA. But then we have this scaffold. The scaffold is something you put up quickly and you take down afterwards to do some repair. Uh, and, and that's what I was telling you about now. But what has been fascinating me over the last um, few months is the idea that you have strings. And so the end of one of these components is an intrinsically disordered 300 amino acid, and it has four different concerted folding and binding regions that grab onto this. So as the reaction goes on in space and time, they're kept locally, but not all interfering. So it decreases the entropy uh, uh, over the time. So it's really fascinating looking at all of this. But you can see I take a long time on one thing. We have to organize the information a little bit better. And so about 10 years ago, I started uh, getting uh, a number of PhD students to organize databases, use modern technology, relational databases. 
Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about Jakarta, but that's uh, an alignment, a structural based alignment of families, of domains and whole structures. We have protein nucleic acids, protein protein, protein small molecule, and we have databases that bring everything in the literature together. And what's happened, that was five years ago, this uh, picture, what's tended to happen is these have all migrated into one. So this program, Credo now, does more or less everything that all of these do. So you can move between a nucleic acid, a small molecule, and so on. And you can move into things like Kemble and find which of the small molecules are, are drug molecules. So. Uh, we can then uh, uh, get uh, to Carter organized. This is Bernardo Ochoa from Mexico. Um, we align the structures and we annotate them um, using a, a method that um, I uh, introduced, which Bernardo's recently changed a bit in its progress. Um, but in this database, we have alignments. So you have 77,000 PDB IDs. 183,000 chains uh, you, uh, with various entries. These are all of multi-protein systems, so not counting the single domain ones. You can look at them as domains and uh, other uh, um, combinations, and you can prepare them all, and then uh, you can annotate them. So all the sequences in our database tell you about the local environment, whether they're in an alpha helix or beta strand, or, or whether they're water accessible or not, whether they're hydrogen bonded. And all of that data will tell you something about the substitution ability of, of these molecules. So uh, this is what we're doing. This is a new method. It was originally JOY, published in um, 1998. Um, but now uh, this is a new program, EXALT, that we haven't published. So Credo, as I said, brings all these together. We take small molecules interacting with the proteins and we express them as structural interaction fingerprints. We do sequence to structure mapping. Uh, we have new molecular shape descriptors. So we uh, published this year, uh, sorry, a couple of years ago, uh, a new method of describing shape uh, recognition. Um, and we've uh, implemented that. And we also look at these ligands in the PDB, the protein data bank, and we uh, fragment them. So, and ask the question, are these small fragments, are they typical and defining the interactions, or um, uh, are they uh, different when they're associated in a larger molecule? And I've done uh, much work to try and convince people that understanding which of these fragments is really the hotspot creator or, or um, taking advantage of the hotspot is really critical. What you can also do with this, um, uh, I just go on to here, is, is you can look at the interaction space. So you can look at interaction uh, fingerprints. So, so this is a kinase, and this kinase uh, interacts with a large number of drug-like molecules and other, uh, other molecules. You can define all those and uh, you can uh, describe the properties of the binding site uh, as well. So this database is, is not just the experimental data, it's uh, the data processed in a relational sense. So then the problem is, how do we extend that information? Because we only know about the structural basis of 10% even in the mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, proteome. Uh, the other 90% we just don't know, as I mentioned before. So we need methods of extending the information, and that's where computational biology comes back in again. So we take our databases, and we combine the information with the data coming in publicly uh, uh, available um, d uh, databases like Uniprot and Ensemble. Um, we combine that with the PDB and our program, to, uh, a database, Tocata, and, and then use that to generate models of homologs. And um, this is using uh, two programs that we wrote for other reasons over the time. So in 1987, I wrote a paper with uh, Janet Thornton, Lynn Sabandra, and Mike Sternberg, 
really saying that the way forward to extend knowledge of proteins was to use knowledge-based methods. So for about 20 years, I think most of what I did in the computational side was really looking to see how you would take the knowledge, express it in various ways in order to recombine it computationally uh, into predictions. The first um, program was Composer in 1987. That sold for, by the way, half a uh, uh, half a million uh, dollars over the years and I gave it to every academic and that's because the companies insisted uh, on having it inside and if I controlled their access to taking it out of my lab I could charge them whereas everybody could use it free so they, so they were actually the victims of their own principles so I have no conscience about that it was free to every academic all my software is and here's Modeler which was the second generation one. So this assembled fragments of homologs, and this one describes spatial restraints. And this was written by one student, Andre Shelley, uh, in one year of his PhD in my lab. Uh, and um, it has 8,000, roughly, citations. So it's, uh, uh, it's really used very much because Andre still maintains it as, as a very accessible program. And, has developed it, but this has been very important. And this is Fugue, which is another program where we take the three-dimensional structure and we predict from three dimensions to one dimension what the sequence variation will be, and therefore from one structure we generate a template which describes all the other proteins that might be available there uh, with a, a similar structure. And this is less used, there's a lot of competition out here, but this one, in its original form, was published in, uh, in 93, uh, in its uh, revised form, rather better, in, in 2001. And then we have a program called Rapper, which you can see is written by a young person who, who likes a different kind of music from composers or fugues, uh, um, and, and that uh, generates an ensemble. Uh, I've had not too much success in convincing the PDB that everybody should store a hundred members of the ensemble instead of one structure, uh, but we'll get there in the end. So we take those and then we put them in a modeling pipeline, which um, Bernardo Ochoa uh, calls Vivace, and this integrates these two programs so that you can very quickly search for other homologues with a similar structure and then build the models of them. And just an example of this was Takash Ochi, who, by the way, was a physicist when he came in my lab, never knew anything about biology. He uh, used this uh, approach, and he searched for homologues, which were so distant you couldn't find them with ordinary sequence methods, uh, of those DNA repair proteins. He found them over one night. He cloned them in the next week, one of them, actually two of them later, he, he e expressed them, uh, characterized by chemistry, determined the three-dimensional structure. So here's a physicist, never been in a molecular biology lab until he walked into my lab unsuspecting. Uh, and so a combination of computational work and experimental work, he later did a lot of cell biology with Steve Jackson. And so this was one of our science papers uh, this year. Uh, it's a completely new molecule, uh, arguing again that things are very complex. Uh, and Steve Jackson is the last author. He was very worried because he published a paper previously saying that he found the last member of this family. So uh, we thought he'd better be the last author of this one, <laughs> of his contributions. Uh, I, I suspect we'll find some more uh, with better methods. So. Uh, then um, what are we going to do? We need to build models for whole genomes. So as I said, what we've done is to form a collaboration uh, with uh, the uh, Salma Swaminathan, although she's moved on to other things now. Uh, and, um, but I'm going there next week to the National Institute of Research in Tuberculosis. But we already have a collaboration with the Genome Center in Hinkston, where we're analyzing uh, thousands of, uh, of sequences and the person on this is, is Sonny uh, and <laughs> she's uh, uh, come home to, to see her family but really she's come home to go to the Chennai Institute and to come to this meeting uh, but, but it's a very nice collaboration. 
And um, uh, we have Sharon Peacock there, who's a great person. Uh, Lali Ramakrishnan uh, is another PI in this consortium. So we'll all be out in India. And uh, actually, um, Sharon uh, had never really been to India very much before, so we're introducing some really good uh, people in an infectious disease to this area. So as I said, if you take the genome of TB, uh, we have structures for about uh, 10%. It's just over 400 now. So how do we extend that information? Um, so, um, of course, what we do is to use the methods that I've described, and this is Bernardo's work. It was thought that Chopin died of TB. We now think he's uh, uh, died of uh, Mycobacterium obsessus, and that's something that Shereen Thomas, uh, I mentioned before, is working on, but I, I, I'm afraid I didn't have enough space to uh, deal with that. Uh, but this is um, a fairly simple uh, um, uh, structural proteome uh, for Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, and what we're doing there now is uh, working with drug discovery groups in the US. Uh, they get a hit in, uh, they think it's in this molecule, but this has three components and nobody knows the structure. So we go to our database and get this structure. We predict that the ligand binds there. In the meantime, they do some uh, um, uh, generation of, of mutants that give resistance in the lab and you can see the predictions <coughs> right. That's just an example of how you can use the methodology in targets which you get in phenotypic screening, uh, but you don't uh, have the original work for them. And so what Sonny is doing is, uh, actually she just sent me this slide yesterday, so I didn't know about Chopin, <laughs> but, but Chopin uh, um, is being extended now because we've realized that this molecular complexity has to be expressed in the database, and we hadn't done this. Um, and, and so that's what one of the things that Sonny is doing, uh, is generating oligomeric forms uh, of all these. And uh, this is uh, her modeling protocol, which you can ask her about <laughs> if you're further interested. But it's generating uh, multi-protein systems. And I should say we've had a lot of collaboration with Srinivasan, Sardamini, uh, 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 and um, uh, uh, others in uh, Bangalore, uh, where we've extended this. So my Chopin is a very conservative version of the database. I think Syncre, uh, uh, Srinivasan is, is, is much more adventurous and covers more than the the, of the genome more, better than we perhaps uh, do. But putting all the methods together is very powerful. So, um, and, and then uh, I, I just put in the mycobacterium recessus. So, because Sherine uh, um, Thomas is working on this experimentally, Sonny's been working with her to try and generate a proteome for this as well. And this is important in cystic fibrosis. So, all very exciting. Um, so what we can then do, you can see, is um, to go through and, and we use all of these programs to generate structures for the whole protein. But what we can also do is to generate an interactome. And so what we've done there is to use all the data from the different experimental uh, areas and put them together to infer an interactome even when we don't have experimental uh, data. I think the thing about computational work is it's very useful in setting up hypotheses, in focusing experimental work, but very often you really have to do the experimental work. But the way I treat it is it quite often prioritizes its things in a very sensible way. So that's uh, the, the way we move. So this is going back now to the question of uh, selectivity and why we have to have molecular complexity. Um, so we now want to know how these interfaces in these proteins look like. Are they flat, uninteresting, and large, as was described 15 years ago? And so Harry Jabb in the lab, who's, uh, as I said, one of the few English in the lab, has been using a Japanese software in this case uh, by Kawabata at GCOM to explore the surface. And what you do is you roll over the surface uh, are balls of different sizes in the computer. And what you can then do is you can color the surface of your protein uh, according to the 
uh, largest molecule or the largest sphere that you can get into a pocket to touch with an atom. And this gives you an idea of depth as a consequence. So this is now a picture of the surface of that molecule, um, RAV51, where we have all the experimental data, just showing uh, how you could identify it. And this slide, I usually like to have Harry in the audience so he can explain what this slide is. But basically what it says it is that the ideas we had some time ago a multi-segment -pro protein, so where you've got discontinuous epitopes and the interaction, has very, very few, but some, deep pockets. But if you have a single segment, either in a loop or in a peptide, then you have a lot of pockets. And so this is very good news for drug uh, discovery, as I said. So um, that's um, the, the question, but um, how do we then do it experimentally? So uh, we have to look and see what's happened. And if you look at the success, and this is Alicia Higuerlo. She was in industry for 10 years and then came back to do a PhD with me. She's analyzed the molecules that uh, chemists have designed against these protein-protein interfaces and found that they're very, very lipophilic. Well, we already knew that with small hydrogen bonds. Uh, but what she's shown is that the chemists on the whole get a few hydrogen bonds in red, polar interactions, and then just add lipophilicity. But if I do the same analysis, or uh, Alicia did that uh, um, here, uh, with approved drugs and then compare them uh, with uh, nature, natural products, and so on, um, what you can see here is that the scissor plot, this is called, is very open. It means that you're not adding much polarity as you add lipophilicity. Nature does it much better. So there's a lot we can learn from understanding how nature gets selectivity uh, uh, by increasing the number of uh, polar interactions. Of course, it's partly done by increasing the flexibility, which has problems in other ways. So it's not quite as simple as I'm saying. But now, how do we target these? Well, I'm going to go through very quickly now. You could do it through allosteric uh, methods. You bind somewhere else on the protein-protein interaction and cause uh, a change. This is a paper we had with many others in cancer cell a couple of years ago, where we showed that one of Sanofi's uh, uh, molecules that was binding the uh, FGF receptor doesn't bind to interfere with uh, the, the two domains that interact with the FGF but actually binds somewhere away from the FGF and affects it allosterically. So that's one way we could target these. Um, but there are other ways of, of modulating these scaffolds and, and so on. And one of them is uh, fragment-based des design. And this is the um, uh, trailer, if you like, for the film on our company, Aztecs. It, it's meant to be an experiment where you have a very small library, so you're decreasing complexity, and you um, explore its binding with a protein uh, and you have to do that with biophysical methods. That would be minimolar binder and then we can sit down with the chemist uh, and we can elaborate that to go to, into nanomolar. So that was the idea I put to another student of mine because um, uh, this company was uh, formed uh, uh, with one of my ex-students as well. And um, we got a small amount of money, half a million dollars. It may seem a lot to you, but it doesn't go very far. <laughs> um, and so uh, Haran Jyoti, is my student from the 80s, who gone into Glaxo. Uh, uh, Chris Abel is a chemist uh, colleague in Cambridge that I met 20 years ago when I went there. And what we do is we take fragments and we explore their binding, get a hotspot, and then uh, elaborate it. And so we began with two people in my lab and one uh, in, uh, 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 in Chris's lab and worked for a year. And then we got more investment. Over the next two or three years, I got $20 million investment. Uh, and that was mainly through the same guy, Steve Bunting, who was my student in the 1970s and was then running venture capital. See, you can, I'm totally dependent on students. You can see that. Um, he was very reluctant, actually, to give us that money because uh, we'd previously had a proposal where I thought the business model wouldn't work. And I was right, actually. It wouldn't have done. Um, but this one did. 
and um, over the years we did this 30 times. So you get your chemists, your biologists, your computer scientists all together around and you look and see what over the previous 24 hours uh, your small fragment has done. And then you say to the chemist, well, that's a fragment. Do you want to elaborate it there or, or at the other end? Which is easiest to do chemically? And the chemist says, I'll elaborate it here or maybe a bit there. And, and you go from minimolar binding very soon up to a, a much higher affinity. Uh, this program seems to have lost the affinities, but now this uh, is about nanomolar mo binding. And we've done this in the company 30 times. We can go in an average of 22 weeks uh, to a nanomolar molecule. And then we take those nanomolar molecules. I've changed my software and it's uh, not showing, but this was nanomolar. So then we're into clinical trials. We had lots of molecules in clinical trials. Some went into phase one briefly and then we, we abandoned them. Um, uh, but other ones um, uh, stayed in. And so in 2013, 2012, we had eight, uh, ten, it depends on how you evaluated them, uh, drugs in clinical trials. Uh, some in collaboration. We had four investments from large companies, 30 million each, so 120 million collaborative investment, 120 million venture capital. But we couldn't run the clinical trials like that, so we had to sell. And um, what we did is to find a friendly company called Otsuka, Japanese company. It's a family company. You don't want to sell to a company with, with a capitalist chief executive who's there for two to four years uh, and all he wants is a bonus because it takes 16 years to make a drug. You need a family with children. They're thinking long term. Uh, that's why I want to sell to a family company if I'm going to sell I into the private sector. And, and so uh, that's it. And, and I, I, I put this picture in again. I wasn't going to put it in. Ah, I seem to have lost it. Um, I, I've lost the picture. I was going to show you the picture uh, of, um, uh, of me uh, in, in the local newspaper uh, 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 describing me as a, uh, 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 as, a, uh, as a star. But I think that was mainly because the molecules they were looking at looked like a star. But anyway, that was all good fun. And um, so then going back into the lab, uh, we try to use these methods experimentally um, uh, of Aztecs on the more complicated systems. So what I do is I take a, a paper that I've got at high levels. I, this is the nature paper again. Uh, I, and I use that as a system that I understand academically, basically, all published in high-level journals. But I take out patents as I put things into nature. You can do it. The main problem is keeping them protected. Universities, uh, if you get no returns on them in a couple of years, tend to give up funding them. That's a big problem. So this one, uh, we uh, took this molecule. This is a paper in nature I told you about. And these are the two little... Uh, pockets here um, which uh, we're going to target and this is our collaborator on the basic science uh, Ashok Venkataraman you may know him he's got a lab in the NCBS uh, or associated with the NCBS and he comes out here quite often I think he has big connections with Bellor and so on uh, but he's been a long-term collaborator for the last 20 years and we've taken this so Ashok set up assays for this because what this does is it's homologous recombination, and, and um, if you, uh, it, what BRCA2 does is to carry the RAV51, which is the recombinase, into the cell, and you see these little nuclei. But if you inhibit it, um, the DNA repair fails, and you see the molecule doesn't end up in the right place. So this is an example of of uh, concerted folding and binding. And the Wellcome Trust has given us about four million, I think, uh, uh, pounds, so six million dollars probably, to work on this uh, since I put in a grant application in 2007. And we now have, have um, very high uh, selectivity. Uh, by the way, we sent it out to referees. The referees said it was unworkable and undruggable. Uh, I just like to tell people I have 740 crystal structures of this and um, lots of fragments like this all bound in, all defined at high resolution. And we now have nanomolar molecules uh, by going through this cycle. Uh, but I just want to make the point, this is a multidisciplinary uh, group. You have to have your computational biologists, you need your biochemists, 
your chemist. This guy is out of industry, John Skidmore, joined our group to coordinate it. And then you need people up in the clinic, Ashok and, and Graham here. So, and you can see this took us a lot longer than it does in the company uh, to get to Nanomola, but we're breaking new ground here. And, and so I think that was important development. So this is the model I think we should go for if we want to target these. Uh, but I just want to end up by saying that, of course, um, all of our drugs uh, are being challenged by two things. Um, one is rare diseases where the population is very small uh, and therefore the conventional methods of spending huge amounts of money, a billion dollars, on a target are not possible. And then the emergence of drug resistance where uh, the resistance is much more complicated than many people thought. And what we've been finding in both of these cases that many of the mutations occur at the oligomeric interactions. And if you think about it, uh, if you've got a pathogen and that wants to create resistance, you've either got to mutate it so it interferes with the drug but not the substrate, or you've got to do something much more subtle. And many of these resistance mutations are at oligomeric interfaces mediating conformational changes allosterically. And, and so we've been using a lot of computational methods to do this. So the method that uh, Srinivasan and Chris Topham uh, developed and published some time ago, I wanted to update that. I'm not going to describe it all. You can ask Srinivasan <laughs> or me. <laughs> and, um, but I've got had two people working on it more recently. One, Catherine Worth, uh, and um, uh, another, Aaron Prosser, to update the substitution tables and make them more relevant uh, to the, the problem. And then we have a computer scientist, Douglas Pyrrhus, who came at the age of 26 um, and at the age of 28 went back to Brazil uh, with an associate professorship. I really wish people wouldn't do that. I'd like my postdocs to stay a bit if they get promoted so quickly. He had about 12 papers within one year, so it's not too su uh, dis surprising, really. So what we've done is to use machine learning methods uh, to look at protein stability, protein-protein affinity, protein nucleic acid affinity, and protein ligand affinity. They all use graph-based signatures, and the real challenge is to have very reliable data on the wild type and the mutant. And so we spent a lot of time putting together databases, and this has been uh, one of the major roles of David Asher in all of this. So what we've done is we have clinicians arriving in the lab on a weekly basis saying, I've got all these mutations, can you tell us what's happening? This is black bone disease, uh, which was the first rare disease ever to be described at this sort of level. And we've done an analysis of that and classified it. Quite a lot of the mutations are in protein-protein interfaces. And what's really interesting, I, I think, I haven't got the slide in here, but what's very interesting is that um, the, the clinical people who've been collaborating with us have reclassified the people in clinical trials according to what kinds of mutations we've described. And it's just amazing. This data's been around. Nobody's analyzed it for years. It, it was all there waiting. And so there's a new classification in clinical trials now going ahead. And um, uh, we've also looked at things like VHL, von Hippel-Lindau disease. Again, lots of interactions in these interfaces. So mutations, escape mutations, and rare disease mutations are using much of the sort of knowledge, if you like. I'm saying it incorrectly, I know. Um, and oh yeah, here's the slide. Uh, so this is just showing uh, how the patients have been reclassified according to what different mechanisms they have. And then very briefly, I want to say that what we're doing over the last little while is looking at uh, the emergence of drug resistance. And we're doing it in cancer uh, with the um, Human Genome Project. We did it uh, to some degree with HIV, uh, but the big focus is on mycobacterium tuberculosis. So we took a large number of well-defined uh, um, structures. Most of the mutations uh, do affect the drug directly, uh, but don't affect so much the substrate. But uh, quite a few of them are like this. They, they actually are at interfaces. So this mutation is here but the drug binds here. 
you see it's disrupting the interface and no doubt affecting that allosterically in some way. And this is an observation that uh, a lot of people have made uh, with you know, genetic disease, but I think it's going to be equally true on drug discovery. So there are a few cases where you get changes in stability which are radical, but these are mainly in redundant enzymes where you're affecting a processing enzyme. And so we have a, a, a way of doing this. I'm not going to go through all of this. Um, but you can see that um, if Cambridge University and its ageist policy uh, doesn't manage to throw me out of the university, which they've been trying to do for the last six years, uh, I, I'm going to focus on thinking about drug discovery to both Mendelian diseases, rare diseases, and to resistance. And of course, a lot of people have been looking at repurposing. I think, Sarmini, you had a some paper, or was it Srinivasan? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is obviously a hugely important area and was really what we were thinking about to some degree in the open source drug discovery program that was run uh, from the DBT here. Uh, but I have some ideas about fragmentation and regrowth. But a very interesting area is if these mutations in genetic disease and resistance are going to be in. Uh, interfaces, maybe we can modify their effect by interfacial stabilizers. So there's a new area of drug, all sorts of ideas come. And I think this is just a typical way of doing computational work on experimental areas and realizing there are new things one can do an experiment and the integration of the two. So there's my team, uh, lots of very nice people, uh, very friendly, very interactive. Um, and um, I hope that I've gone on rather long and I apologize for that. Um, I hope you can see this interplay between experiment and computational work is really quite an exciting area to be in and maybe does give the opportunity for new companies. If you want to form something down here, I know uh, that, that um, uh, Ramesh has some plans, <laughs> but not quite in this area. Um, but uh, I can see there are lots of opportunities for different things. But the real challenge is how do we make drugs really cheaply uh, in order to uh, really pursue a personalized medicine or a personalized pathogen medicine, if you like, uh, um, in the future. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir, for taking us the interesting work of putting complexity, complexity and beautiful way of facilitating protein structures. The interaction and interfaces can help us in designing new drugs, especially for rare diseases. Thank you very much for this wonderful lecture, sir. Thank you.